Good evening, everybody. I'm Reverend Liz Walker, pastor of Roxbury Presbyterian Church, and I welcome you all to Where Do We Go From Here? Coping in the next season of COVID-19. More than 2,000 of you registered for this special community conversation about the pandemic with Dr. Anthony Fauci, and that is critical because we need as many facts as possible. That's our goal tonight. But first, if you've lost someone to COVID, or if you're struggling with COVID right now, or you so know someone else who's struggling, we want you to know you are in our hearts, we care about you, and we are praying for you. And now to the good news. Three drug companies, Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca, have announced vaccines that are very effective, they say, to meet this challenge. But there is a greater challenge. Many people are resistant to taking the vaccine, and the pandemic continues to spread at alarming levels. Tonight, we're going to talk about all of that with our special guest, Reverend Dr. Gloria White Hammond, who is the co pastor of Bethel AME Church here in Boston. She's a pediatrician and a member of the Mayor's Task Force on Healthcare Equities. And from Washington, D.C., our special guest, Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Now we have plenty we wanna ask Dr. Fauci and he's got a limited amount of time. But before we get to that, I've got two other pieces of business I wanna take care of. First of all, if I had to choose one word to describe the last seven months all over the world, I would use the word trauma. The whole world has been traumatized. The loss of life, the loss of normalcy, the loss of connection. And we're all trying to figure out how to cope. Helping people cope is one of the main ministries of Roxbury Presbyterian Church. That's why we're here tonight. The Corey Johnson Program for Post-Traumatic Healing was started in 2014 as a way to help our community cope with violence. Take a quick look at the work we do. In my community, it's a war zone. Um, there's always cops flying down the street. There's always a crime scene going on. I helped my next door neighbor bury her son who was murdered in Walgreens parking lot and they threatened to kill my child at least nine times. I was raped by a Catholic priest. When the phone was ringing, I picked it up and the other voice said, you better get to Brigham and Women because Corey has been shot. I think I knew right away that he was gone. But it, it was it was a kind of numb feeling. What I've learned about trauma is if you hold it in, it consumes you. It takes your body over. Come find your mercy. Love support, consistency, and safety. We are trying to create a platform for young men to be able to talk about their pain, their fears, and what is going on, and so that they can begin to have a place to share how they feel. So when Doug reached out to me, I was immediately enlightened and in tune with him that we should indeed pursue this because I think that folks in my town in Chattanooga and, and beyond really need to uh, speak to one another, listen to one another. And sometimes uh, we can feel alone as an individual, we can feel alone in our neighborhoods, and we can feel alone in our cities that this struggle is just our struggle, but it isn't just a struggle of Chattanooga. It isn't just a southern struggle. It isn't simply the struggle of Boston. It is a national struggle, struggle for freedom and justice and healing. I think that uh, I think that it's gonna be okay. I really feel that. So we want to know if we have a reason for any optimism when it comes to this COVID nineteen pandemic. Let's go right to our panelists right now, Dr. Uh, White Hammond and Dr. Fauci. Again, thanks for joining us. First question to you, Dr. Fauci. We're so glad you're here. I have read, contrary to what we just saw on our poll, that as many as 40% of this country 
uh, well, actually that kind of sticks with our poll, is resistant to taking this vaccine. But I am pretty sure that people in my community, which is a poor community, a marginalized community, a disenfranchised community, and a community that is disproportionately represented by COVID victims, I know those numbers are higher in my community. So what do you say to these people? How are you persuading people to take this vac these vaccines? Well, thank you for having me uh, here. It's a real pleasure to be with you. I think what one needs to do is to try and find out what the reason that they are reluctant to get vaccinated. Is it a broad generic reason, a distrust of the medical establishment because of the his history of the abuse, particularly of the African-American community, with things that date back as far as Tuskegee and, and, and uh, Henrietta Lacks issues? Or is it something about the process of the speed with which this vaccine was developed and somewhat of the mixed signals that one has been getting in this divisive society from Washington? So you can address each of these. First of all, it's important to understand that the process of the development of a vaccine and the decision as to whether or not it's safe and effective is a process that is independent of the federal government and independent of people who might have a vested interest like the pharmaceutical company. Let me explain. When we have the, the, the trials that you just referred to that have showed a high degree of efficacy between 90 and 95% in three separate vaccine trials from three separate companies. The determination as to whether or not it's safe and effective is made by an independent body, what's called a data and safety monitoring board, which monitor the trial. And when you reach a point when there's information to indicate that it is truly safe and effective, they are the only ones that initially have access to that. So the company or the government can't try and manipulate it to its own advantage. It's an independent group. When that independent group determines that the vaccine is safe and effective, they make that information known to the company, which then takes that data and gives it to the independent scientists of the Food and Drug Administration, the career scientists, not politicians, not people who might have a vested interest. Those people examine the data very carefully and then work with their own advisory committee, which is yet again another independent body that doesn't have to answer to anyone. They then look at it and make the recommendation to go ahead and have the FDA go for what's called an emergency use authorization or a full biological license application approval. So what you're having is both independence and transparency. And at the end of the day, all of those data become public because they will be published in peer reviewed journals. So the process is a sound process. Number two, the speed with which it's been done does not compromise safety, nor does it compromise scientific integrity. It's the exquisite nature of the breathtaking scientific advances that have occurred over the last decade or so that have allowed us to do things in weeks to months that formerly took years. So you should not be intimidated by how fast it was done and say it was done so fast it can't be safe. The safety issues were primary in everyone's mind during the testing of this vaccine. And note that we're not even allowed to apply for use of it until 60 days past the time that half the people got their last dose. So we know that safety is paramount. Having said that, we are fortunate that we have now three, and we likely have more than three, vaccines that are extraordinarily effective in preventing disease and serious disease. And since minority communities, particularly African-Americans and Latinx, elderly individuals 
those with underlying conditions, those who have suffered most from this terrible outbreak are the ones that stand to benefit the most. So they are the ones to get vaccinated, not only for their own personal benefit, so that we can have a blanket of protection over the entire community. Because the more people that get vaccinated, if you have a highly effective vaccine and the overwhelming majority of people get vaccinated, we can crush this outbreak the same way vaccinations have crushed smallpox and polio and measles. It's the same thing. Quick follow before Reverend Gloria has her question. If the uh, vaccine was available to you today, would you take it, Dr. Fauci? Based on the data and based on the FDA's recommendation, I would wait for my turn and I would definitely take it. And I would adv advise and recommend to my own family to take it. Thank you very much. Reverend Gloria? Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Fauci. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. I have heard you reference this blanket of protection, and it's, it's certainly, it's a beautiful metaphor. But help us, what is this blanket of protection? Sure. And how do we get it? Okay. That's called herd immunity. And what that means, when the overwhelming majority of the population is protected by vaccine, or having been infected and recovered so that they are now protected, when the virus enters into a community, it has no place to go because there are not a lot of susceptible people. The more susceptible people are, the more momentum the virus gets to spread. If everyone or almost everyone is protected, you have what's called this blanket of herd immunity. You know what it really as, as sort of the metaphor comes from, you know you see the pictures when you look at films about Africa, when you have the wildebeests and the gazelles and everyone, and you see the lions or the, or the, or the predatory animals trying to get them, and you have the weak ones, the elderly or the young ones that are there. What does the herd do? If all of the strong herd stick together, they protect the vulnerable because the, in the case of the metaphor, the predators that are trying to hurt you never get to you because you have this blanket of protection. If you have the overwhelming majority of the community is already protected because you're vaccinated, then vulnerable people who might not make a good response, who are sick and can't get vaccinated, they are protected because the community is protected. So you really have a responsibility to yourself and a societal and community responsibility to be part of this broad protection. So I have a follow-up question to that. As you know, uh, communities of color have suffered disproportionately with regard to this disease. So for example, in Boston, African-Americans, 25% of the population, 34% of the deaths. So does that mean in terms of the, the percentage of people who get vaccinated, does that mean that we should have, should we have a higher percentage of people who get vaccinated than the percentages in white communities, for example? I believe that both white community and uh, African Americans and Latinx should have as high a proportion as you possibly can. One thing that, that's an excellent entry into an important issue, we want to get more African American and Latinx, as well as Native American and Alaska Natives, into the clinical trial because we want to be able to say in the actual trial that proves that a vaccine is safe and effective. We can look our African American and our Latinx colleagues in the eye and say, you know what? We've proven that it is not only safe and effective in whites, it's safe and effective in you in your community. And that's the reason why we encourage members of the African American and Latinx community to volunteer for the clinical trials when it is in your area so that you could be part of this process of proving that it actually works. Dr. Fauci, one of the things that is confusing is that despite the rising infection, <laughs> there seem 
seem to be lowered death rates. Uh, I, I think that is correct. And so that a lot of people are thinking, well, that means we're out of the woods because people aren't dying like they used to be dying. First of all, is that true? No. So there's a difference between death rate and number of deaths. If you have many, many millions of infections and still a lot of people die, the rate may still be low. Whereas if you have few infections and the same number of people die, the rate is high. So don't be fooled by saying the rate is down. We now have between 1,000 and 2,000 deaths literally every day. Sometimes it goes down to 800, sometimes it's 1,500, but we still have a lot of people dying. You know what the number you need to focus on? There have been a quarter of a million deaths mm -hmm. from COVID-19 in literally nine or 10 months. Mm -hmm. If we don't stop the spread of this infection, there will be more hospitalizations, more intensive care, more deaths. Now, the critical issue is that even though you're saying the rates of death are lower, we're getting younger people getting infected. We're also doing better at taking care of people. But that's not an excuse to just say, well, who cares? Let more people get infected. If we don't stop this outbreak, we will have an extraordinarily large number of deaths. That's the reason why vaccines are so important. We want you to abide by public health measures, uniform wearing of masks, avoiding crowds in congregate settings, keep physical distancing, doing things outdoors preferentially to indoors, washing your hands as frequently as you can. If you combine those public health measures with the advantage of a vaccine that will soon be with us, we can put an end to this outbreak. I have another question really quickly. We're receiving tons of questions from our audience about long-term side effects of the vaccine. Can we, uh, can we, can you answer that? Is that, is it too soon to know what the long-term effects will be of the side effects? Well, there are, there are three aspects of that and I'll quickly answer it. There's the immediate, namely you get injected. And you get a sore arm, some people get an ache, some people feel poorly for a day, get a fever. That goes away almost invariably in 24 hours. Then there's the intermediate, something that might happen, you know, a week or two or three later. That's what we're looking at in the clinical trial, and we have not seen any severe adverse events that we could relate to the vaccine thus far. Then there are the longer-term effects. Now. When you look at the history of vaccinology, about 90 plus percent of events that are severe occur between 30 and 45 days following the vaccination. And for that reason, before the FDA will apply for an emergency use authorization, they will wait 60 days from the time the person, half the people got their last dose. So they're not even going to be looking at giving the vaccine to anyone until you have a 60-day period where there were no adverse events. 60 days, within 60 days, almost all the historical adverse events that were more long-term occurred. So safety is a very important issue. There's nothing that one can do in an intervention medically where there's some possibility of an adverse event. But when you look at the hundreds and hundreds of millions of people who've been vaccinated, the long-term adverse events have been less than minuscule in the big picture of the, of, of the protection that you get from a vaccine. Dr. Fauci, as you know, there are different vaccines. Some vaccines can give you immunity for forever. And then for others, like the flu vaccine, every year we get another vaccine. Do we know what will be the, the, the duration for these vaccines? We do not know because we haven't had enough time. Remember, we've only been in this for less than a year and vaccinations will be starting to be given 
in December and then through the first and second and third quarter of 2021. We will be following that closely. We do, not, we do not know how long the durability of the immunity is. But let us assume, which it likely will not be lifelong. It likely will not be as long as measles. But if it's long enough to get us through this pandemic, then it is conceivable that we may want to every year or two or three come back and boost someone. But the challenge now is to end this pandemic. And we feel fairly confident that the durability would be at least enough to put the lid on this outbreak. If we have to give boosters later on, so be it. That's not the worst thing. One of our city councilors have this question for you. Andrea Campbell says, with all the promising reports about the vaccine, do we just assume, Dr. Fauci, that early vaccination preference will be given to communities and demographics hardest hit? Is that already an assumption or are people working on that now? That's a very good question. What will happen is that when the companies get their EUA, the organization that's responsible for the prioritization is the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And they do that in close advice from the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. But when vaccine gets distributed from the companies where the warehouses and they go out to different parts, locally, the local health departments will be given the prioritization of how you would best distribute the vaccine. Likely, if it acts like it does historically, healthcare providers who put themselves at a daily risk of getting infected will be high up in that priority, as will the elderly and those with underlying conditions. It hasn't been finally determined yet because the EUAs have not been granted. But when they are, the CDC will make that determination. And this question came in from a, a member of our church who had four or three uh, family members who had COVID. And he wants to know if those family members should get the vaccine. They, they survived COVID, but should they take the vaccine if it's made available? If they are, if one of the recommendations is that people who are in a high risk category and who have been infected should get the vaccine, they should get it. I would imagine that an individual who is infected and recovered, you don't know whether they're still at risk. So I would say that I don't know what the priority would be, but they should ultimately get vaccinated. Yeah, I have one final burning question, uh, Dr. Fauci. I've certainly been impressed with your intellect and inspired by your integrity. The intriguing question for me is that over the last eight, nine months, we have seen from day to day, you, you've been buked, you've been scorned, you've been talked about, sure as you're born. And inevitably, you managed to stay cool, calm, and clear. How, how do you cope in the midst of all of this? Uh, where, what are the resources you turn to to keep you clothed in your right mind? Well, there are two things. One is I have developed the ability to focus like a laser beam on what my responsibility is to protect the health and the safety of the American people. And indirectly by doing that, the health and the safety of the rest of the world. So when you focus on that, you really get a bit of energy. That is complemented by uh, another very special source I have, and that's a wife who is extraordinary, who understands me, who supports me, and when I have that, everything else that challenges me seems almost trivial. What do you do when you are having those moments that kind of go, gosh, I, I just can't take any more of this, or do, do you even have those, ever? I do, <laughs> but I... <laughs> But sometimes the thing that I relieve stress is I've always been a runner. So I go out and I'm getting a little bit too old to run as much as I do. So I do power walking. I love being outside. I don't get a chance to do that, except quite frankly, I likely will be doing it after my next Zoom, which is in a couple of minutes, sometimes late tonight. And I do that with my wife. And she's, as I mentioned, 
uh, keeps me sane. She's the anchor and the rock in what I do. That is really great. Well, we are so uh, just blessed to have you, Dr. Fauci. If you just have any parting words for our community, we have probably two minutes. They said you had a hard 59 out. So I just wanted to give you two minutes to kind of sum up your appeal to our community to take this vaccine. Yeah, I, over the last almost a year, have witnessed the disproportionate suffering that your community has gone through. Um, it is something that is really extraordinarily unfortunate. And the reasons for that, I do hope when this is all over, we address, namely the social determinants of health and the inequities that you've been faced with essentially forever. So that's the first thing. I totally understand what you've been through, and I plead with you that we as a community, your community, the community that we all live in, can do something about this if we abide by the public health measures and get vaccinated. Don't deprive yourself of the advantage of an extraordinarily important advance in science by not getting vaccinated. Protect yourselves, your family, and your community. Dr. Fauci, thank you so much for being with us. You are, we are gonna just come pray for your continued health. On to your next Zoom, be safe, and uh, we're gonna get this thing. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you so much. And thank you for the we prayer. Will be praying. Praying. <laughs> thank you, have a good one. Dr. Anthony Fauci, he told us he had to get off at 59 and we were determined <laughs> to get him off because we were so uh, just privileged to have him here. He is just like that Energizer bunny, Gloria. Yes, he really is. And, and again, it's so inspiring to have someone who clearly is very competent in his field um, and operates with integrity. That's, that's refreshing, that's re inspiring. You know, one of the things that he said that I don't wanna uh, bypass because we talk about it in our trauma work is that he said the thing that keeps him going is that he knows he has a purpose. He knows that there's something he has to do. Yes. And that's the, one of the things that Colleen Charka, who's our director of our, uh, of our trauma program, talks about people who are recovering from trauma, who are trying to heal from trauma, is this notion of, of kind of regaining meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. Do you find that as well in your work? And we're going to talk a little bit more about your work. Absolutely. For me, I think of it in terms of calling and being clear about the thing that I'm called to do. Uh, and... Uh, Again, it doesn't necessarily every single day, I don't necessarily do something on that, but I do know that there's a greater work that I'm a part of, that I've been, been fully equipped to do, and, and uh, keeping my focus on that calling certainly does help me to get through. Absolutely. We want to make sure that you get your questions answered. I know this was a whirlwind, but we took what we could get from Dr. Fauci, and he only had that time because this man is going all around, zooming all over the country with this appeal because he wants people to take the vaccine. But if we don't get to your questions about the, the vaccine, you can still get in touch with me. I want to hear from you. And so I want you to know that you can follow me, uh, and you can reach me on Twitter. This is all new for me, just for you. <laughs> Twitter at Liz Walker one and you can reach me on Instagram, and that's Pastor Liz with two Zs. So if you have any questions that were not answered uh, with uh, Dr. Fauci, we knew we only had so much time, we took it. But we will try to still get to your answers. Now, for this next part of our program, we're going to talk about coping. We're going to talk about coping uh, through all of this. How are we going to continue to get, it was bad enough the first month. But then you go on and on and on. And uh, so that's where we want to go. Hopefully the mayor is going to stop by, Mayor Walsh, and talk with us. Uh, and he's going to tell us some things. And Gloria and I are going to discuss it. And we're going to take your questions. Reverend Dana Baker will be here to kind of go through your questions about coping so that we can all uh, kind of find a way to get through this. But Gloria, first of all, I wanted to talk about what you do, because I want people to understand that we're not just two old friends who, who went to Sudan uh, 100 years ago and, and, and built a friendship. You are on the Mayor's Task Force for Health Care Inequities. Am, am I getting that right? That's right, to address inequities. Initially, that committee was formed in the, initially in the wake of COVID-19. And of course, as we 
continued to see more and more disparities and began to understand the origins of those disparities and the extent to which they're very much informed by what Dr. Fauci referred to as the social determinants of health, the, the, the places that are often um, uh, victimized in terms of where we live, where we work, where we play. And uh, that we recognized that we needed to look not just for the moment in terms of addressing the, the acute crisis, but look more deeply at the, the root of the crisis. And so that's, I'm on that committee and that's uh, Mayor Walsh's committee. Thank you so much for joining us. Great to see you. I know, I don't know if you got to hear Dr. Fauci, but he had lots of good advice for us. But I wanted to first start out with you and thank you so much for joining us. First of all, tell us where Boston is. What's the latest on, on uh, your biggest concerns and, and maybe your, your, your best optimism about where the city is with COVID right now? I will f thank you very much, Reverend Walker, and it's awesome to be with you. And I wanna thank you for having uh, me here tonight. I also wanna thank uh, Reverend Gloria White Hammond f for your amazing work as well, thank you. And I thank Dr. Fauci, I know he's not here anymore, but I wanna thank him uh, for what he's done all for our country in giving us a lot of peace uh, and serenity, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. during a very difficult time. Uh, I just want to also acknowledge anyone on the call, um, anyone in this Zoom who lost a loved one to COVID-19. Um, you know, just you are in our thoughts and prayers um, as we move forward here. Uh, tonight's discussion uh, is really important. I think where we are in the city right now is we're, we're in, I wouldn't call it a second surge, but we're certainly uh, keeping an eye on the numbers. We're seeing increased numbers like we, like, like we did almost in, um, uh, April and May uh, of this year. Um, we're not seeing the hospitalization where it was. Uh, we're not seeing, thank God, people losing their life uh, like they did earlier in the pandemic, at least here in Boston. Um, about 50% of our cases are coming from people under the age of 39. Uh, roughly 50% of our cases are coming from Latino community, a lot of intergenerational uh, families living together. Uh, we're seeing the two areas that we're seeing the biggest increase. One is in the workplace. Uh, people that that work together, you know, get very comfortable around each other and they're taking masks off. So we're seeing outbreaks in those areas. And the second area we're seeing um, a, an outbreak is, happen is happening on in house parties and house gatherings, uh, where we're seeing people again taking, putting their guard down. And we're asking people as we go through the holiday season here uh, to be very, very careful um, in take, making sure that you're protecting yourself, uh, you're protecting your family members by wearing masks, by physical distancing, by washing hands, all of the things that Dr. Fauci probably talked about tonight are things that we need to do. We need to continue to do that. Uh, we saw it work in the months of June, July, August, September here in Boston, where we had an infection rate of about 1.8% to 2.8%. Uh, we're seeing you know, an infection rate now in the city, roughly, I think it's about 8%, but we're seeing some neighborhoods as high as 16% infection rate. So we, we do have to go back to what, what made it work for us. In the beginning of the pandemic, what we noticed very early on, and I referenced a little bit about the Latino community now, but we, what we noticed early on was roughly 44% of all of our cases uh, were in African-American Black community. Uh, and, and we realized that, that there was a, a big inequities when it came to healthcare and also a, a mistrust in healthcare. So we formed the COVID-19 Health Inequities Task Force um, to, 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 because we knew that existing inequities in healthcare and our workforce would cause COVID to hit the black and brown community harder and it was hitting them harder. The task force is, is comprised, excuse me, of people who are known and trusted in the community, including Dr. White Hammond, who has been very engaged and involved in this. Uh, in this work, we have been proactive and intentional about equity. Uh, we have to be willing to see what is working and what is not, reaching out to those who are most in need and most in need of support. Uh, that's, what, that's what we've been doing with the task force. Uh, we're among uh, the first cities to release the COVID-19 data by race and ethnicity. That's something that wasn't happening in the very beginning of the pandemic. Getting those facts out were, were very important in transparent ways uh, to, to explain to people and, and, and it, it helped lead our response with investments and in testing at our community health centers. Uh, we began those investments in our community with uh, the greatest health inequities, both historically in, in COVID data. Uh, every week, the task force is looking at data on cases and, and deaths by each neighborhood to better understand the gaps that are out there. And, and, and we need to be more intentional about the, what the need is. Uh, and they're helping us guide, us guide us in this crisis right now. 
The task force is also guided um, key partnerships and investments, in particular in communities like our immigrant COVID collaboration uh, and our investments in the Greater Boston Latino Network. And now the Resiliency Fund is also investing in the Black Boston COVID-19 Coalition. So we're making those investments. The Resiliency Fund, which we created, which was all raised privately, uh, we've distributed over $29 million into communities hit the hardest. Uh, the grantees are 54% of them are led by people of color. Uh, the task force is now a key contributor to our work on treating racism as a public health crisis. Uh, we're doing this work in partnership with Boston's healthcare sector and we're funding it with money uh, shifted from the police overtime budget. So it's, it's, this is all about, this is all what came out of COVID-19 COVID uh, when we enter this, but we need to do, we need to continue the work. And, and we also, when we think about, and I'm not sure if Dr. Fauci talked about this, when we think about a vaccine and, and, and Reverend Walker and Reverend White Hammond, you know this, we need to make sure that people understand the importance of trusting the medical profession and we need to get people vaccinated. We need to get people tested. And we also need to quite honestly deal with, deal with healthcare in a whole different manner uh, in our country. But we're here in Boston, so we have to deal with healthcare in a whole different manner. Trust has to come back into the healthcare system, it, particularly in our communities of color, particularly in our black and Latino community. Uh, this is from uh, at large city councilor, Julia Mejia. And she says, concerning the opening of restaurants, casinos, and cinemas while keeping public schools remote, uh, uh, Councillor Mejia says that in Europe, they do the opposite. They open the schools and they close the restaurants and the, and the cinemas. How should these kind of tough decisions be made moving forward? Yeah, I have major concerns across the board with achievement gaps. Um, and I said it from day one, uh, our kids, most of our kids have not been in school, at least the public school kids in Boston. Uh, these are tough decisions and they're, 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 in some ways they're balanced next keeping our kids and teachers safe and getting our kids back in school where they belong has been something that we've worked with really hard in the city of Boston. Uh, those are the same students who need to be in school, have parents who need to be at work and don't have other sources of income. Uh, we, you know, we've worked on food relief, rental relief, resiliency funds to support many of the families. Uh, we've gotten permanent rental vouchers to a thousand BPS students, uh, families I should say, uh, in the need tremendous. That's why when we look at this, we have to look at it through the equity lens we're not just talking about the kinds of business that can open, but also lower wage workers who are struggling to, 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 to survive, uh, with immigrant workers who, who, who are having a hard time getting through this, this, these tough times. In Europe, the national government funded businesses to shut down and paid everyone to stay home, putting their focus on opening schools. That's why it happened. We expect, I hope, in the new year to have a stronger federal, federal response that will allow us to do more on every aspect of this pandemic. Uh, that's why, you know, I, I was on a call yesterday with uh, President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, and they were talking of investing billions and billions of dollars into our schools to reopen. Um, you know, Euro Europe has, in some cases, handled the, the educational component of the pandemic completely different than we have. Uh, my cousin is a, is a principal in Ireland. Uh, and when they shut school down, they, they did open before the business is open. Uh, and, and you're right, Reverend Walker. I actually think we're going to have to think about reimagining education in this country right now. Um, the, 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 the economic gap, I mean, not the economic gap, but the, the, the opportunity gap is only growing. The achievement gap is only growing. Kids are not going to learn online. They're gonna, they need to be back in school. And right now, today, Boston's closed, except for highest need students. And hopefully, as the new year comes, um, I don't think it'll be before the new year, but as the new year comes, we'll be able to get our kids back into school. As you know, our, it's our younger population now who tend to, who seem to be the, the more of the spreaders. What are you doing to get to the younger people in the city of Boston? That's a great question. What we're doing now is, is I talked to my mayor's youth council the other day, and I asked them to to kind of activate their social networks uh, to, to put words out to young people about the importance of, of, of not congregating. And, and quite honestly, a lot of what we're seeing is in the ages of, you know, I'm, I'm going to estimate this, you know, 20s to, to 39. Those are the folks that, that, that are having house parties where they'd be out at the bar, they'd be out of the scene and be out more. And we're asking people that, you know, we've done a really what I think was a good job in the summertime to keep our numbers down. You know, we have a few more months of the virus. We can't just expect the virus is not going to go away. And I've asked people to, 
even though you might people younger people say well i'll get the virus i'm going to be fine which most times you will be there is cases where you won't be but what happens is you bring the virus into the home and if you're living if you if you live in a house with your parents or your grandparents or you visit them what, what's happening is you're putting them at risk and they're the ones that, that, that are going to be hit the hardest by this you've seen it on the, on the task force uh, doctor when, when you talk about you know not having the proper information in front of you so we're trying to use our social networks. Anyone listening today, I would just ask you, please, you know, during the Thanksgiving season, put information out there that, you know, this is not the year to have large family gatherings. This is not the year to be traveling. This is not the year to be, to be, to be doing all of that. Even though Thanksgiving is a time for thanks, um, the, 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 in giving, the best giving we can do in Thanksgiving is by by spending time in your small little network of family and not, 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 not being together in large groups. Are you uh, finding that people are listening? Because uh, Gloria asked you, you know, what are you doing to young people? But are young people heeding this advice from what you can tell so far? I, I think a lot of people are. I mean, I think our, our numbers, I'll just, I'll just give you the, the basic numbers. Two numbers I look at every day is the average case, cases every day of coronavirus in the city of Boston. And we do seven day averages. So if you go back 21 days, uh, we go back 28 days. We had 121 cases per day four weeks ago, 25 cases three weeks ago, 224 cases a, a week ago. And now I'll get a new average. We're probably about 225 cases per day. Uh, those numbers are pretty high. The hospitalization rate in Boston is, is still manageable. So our concern, what, what I would say one of my concerns is we don't want to go back to a situation where we were in, in April and May, where hospitals had to cancel elective procedures and put other people at risk. So w w the younger population is getting the virus. They're not getting as sick with the virus right now. But what's happening is we're starting to see that hospital number creep up a little bit. The numbers are going up slowly, but slowly and slowly, slower and slower every day, but they're still going up. So we need to do everything we can to keep that hospitalization down. The way we do that is by not, not, not contracting the virus. Okay. Uh, Reverend Dana Baker, who has been our kind of a, a facilitator of all the questions that are coming in, I believe has a question for one of us. So this one actually goes back to something that you guys were talking about with Dr. Fauci for a little bit, where we were talking about the skepticism um, regarding the, vi the vaccine. And so one of our attendees was asking if, um, if either Reverend uh, Dr. Gloria or Reverend Liz, you could talk a little bit more about why you believe the level of skepticism about taking the vaccine in communities of colors is so high. Sure, I can start with that. Uh, Dr. Fauci referenced it and uh, to a large extent that this is rooted in a longstanding um, uh, uh, suspicion uh, with regard to the health system in general. As you know, for generations, but we did not have adequate health services available to us. There's also the long history of, of using, if you will, uh, African Americans as subjects. I'm certainly familiar with the, the Tuskegee study, uh, the invention of, of OBGYN and how Black women were really victimized in the course of, of developing that discipline. So this is long standing, and it's absolutely true. At any, on any given day, any number of African Americans or people can, of color can tell you about uh, a, an experience that they had uh, trying to get care. I certainly have stories of, of people who had, had unfair treatment in the course of trying to get care for COVID-19. So that suspicion persists and, uh, and it translates into this vaccine as well, that, uh, that, that how do we know that this is for us? So that all of those things that are, as I remind my clinicians, my friends in the hospital, all of the things that are out here in the context of the lives that we live every day are very real in the context of hospitals too. And if I could just add to that, uh, we, in our trauma work, we talk to our neighbors who tell us about incidents, this is recent, of going into a clinic or going into a hospital and feeling uh, uh, dismissed, uh, not being taken seriously, ignored. Uh, this is a perception that's it's universal among Black people, uh, Black women in particular. And there are, research, there are studies and there's much research that backs it up, that people just feel like, you know, somehow the system just goes here and we're here and, 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 it, and it, that accumulates. And, and we call that trauma after a while. You don't want to go to the hospital. You don't want to go to the doctor because you don't think 
people are going to treat you as a human being. So the same thing you see in the criminal justice uh, area, the same thing you see in education, you see in healthcare. People feel uh, not fully embraced, not fully engaged by systems, mm -hmm. and that and that becomes a problem. And it and black people, it's like you know you pass a black people, you pass another black person, you kind of nod. It's kind of, it's just, it's a knowledge that we just know uh, now because of what's happened this summer in the country uh, with the, uh, the shootings and all of the unrest in this country. Hopefully more and more people are becoming aware of these things that we know. If I could just jump in real quickly, just um, even in Boston, declaring racism as a public health crisis and tackling the issue um, from the public health standpoint in other areas is really important. And then Carolyn Crockett, I'm not sure if she's on here, Dr. Carolyn Crockett, who's the chief of equity in the city. Uh, that's one of the areas that um, she's been talking to organizations and hospitals uh, about as well, uh, about bringing back, I don't know if the confidence is the right word, but I think it has to be an educational component in, in, in having, allowing access for all in, in, um, in, um, in medical institutions. In, in the, the, the past story, and we talk about systemic racism, it's the systemic change, and that's also in health. And I think that, you know, is there an opportunity right now with the coronavirus to actually change that and, and to, to bring confidence back and to allow people the opportunity? I, you know, we haven't seen it necessarily yet uh, because obviously the numbers of COVID-19 and and the Health Inequities Task Force has been grappling with this issue for now five months probably. Um, so there still has to be work to be done. One of the problems I see right now, uh, Mr. Mayor and Reverend Gloria, is that everything we're trying to do, we're trying to do in at warp speed. I hate to use that, that that's a, a, not a good word, but we are trying to move quickly because everything is so urgent with this uh, COVID-19. But these are issues that have taken centuries to kind of cement in in the very soul of this country and and i you know re restoring trust is going to take i think a lot longer than a commission or a task force or or you know trying to do it as quickly as as i think that's a real problem we have i think that you know during covid the, you know a lot more people are more cognizant and paying attention to what's happening um when george floyd was murdered um, you know, everyone was in front of their TV watching it. And I, and I said this at a press conference, it just felt different. The response felt different. The attention felt different. The response, the, I, I'm on calls with mayors from around the country and we're still talking about the issues of systemic racism in our city and how, how, how are we handling it? What are we doing in response? What are legislators doing? What are people doing? And I think that, you know, at some point, and I think this is the point in time, that the response needs to be different. The response can't be a bunch of empty promises in front of a TV camera or a bunch of legislation filed that doesn't go anywhere. It has to be a, a real systemic response, systematic response. And I think that, um, you know, I, I just, even, even the intensity of the job of being the mayor, I've been mayor for seven years now, and We've had racial incidents around the country. We had Ferguson, we had New York, and incidents in New York and Baltimore. This time, this time for me personally, um, you know, people people aren't going and weren't going to accept just the same old, same old. And I think that with COVID, there's a way. For, when I say not, it's not because of COVID, but because of the time we're in, our response can be can be different and can be sustainable long term. And I think that you're absolutely right. It's not going to be done in one year because you're talking hundreds of years of racism. But I do think that we have to we have to continue to move forward in this moment in time. Young people, the, the generation, the younger generation, they're not going to accept um, any of us standing still. Have you got any spiritual perspective on on where we are, what this what this is about, or, or personal? Have you thought about that? This extraordinary time we're living in. Yeah, it, I, I, I would say it's an exciting time. It's been a difficult time, but I don't know that I've ever felt quite so energized in terms of of where we are. I think that that there that people really are looking very deeply, and I think deeply internally uh, to to figure out where 
each of us is part of the problem rather than the solution. So I am feeling excited about that. I've learned to look for ways that God redeems dark times. And I, I think that I'm seeing that. I think it, as tragic as George Floyd incident was, that it's been an important moment for us to, the fact that we were all focused, at, we were all at home and we could all focus on the television at the same time and all be looking at the same news was important. So it was hard to dismiss it because we were all focused on it. And I, I think that, that being a collective audience in a sense has empowered us to do that. And so I, I, I do see that there are many ways that people have come forward. I've heard, as, as even though I've heard of losses, I've also heard, heard of families drawing closer together, people getting more clarity in terms of their calling and working to fulfill it. And again, a lot of challenge, but I have sensed that, that even in the midst of this, there have been some ways forward, both individually and collectively. Candace, who is, um one of the people on the call is says, what's the best approach that public health professionals can take in messaging the vaccine acceptability? And I think we've been hearing two components. One is related to some of the things that Dr. Fauci talked about in terms of you know, being very clear and the focus towards you know, things like long-term side effects or whatever that would prevent people. But then there's also the messaging that we've been talking about in terms of the disparities and the systemic issues. And so do you have any thoughts about what that messaging should look like or um, from a public health standpoint? I'm uh, on the uh, governor's task force for the COVID vaccine distribution uh, uh, committee. It's a working group and, and we make recommendations on, we're trying to figure out how to distribute once we get all the vaccines and who gets it first. And part of that is messaging and without giving anything, because nothing has been resolved at this point, uh, it's, it's clear that we have to be transparent about the messaging. Whatever we do, it has to, and I think Dr. Fauci touched on this, it has to be, uh, it has to be honest. It can't be uh, too jazzy. It has to be, because we don't have time for that. Uh, we have to let people know all that we know. There are a lot of things that we don't know right now, and that's just a fact. And so uh, as we get information, I think that we have to get it out as clearly and as transparently as possible because we have to, again, as the mayor said, you have to work on restoring trust here. And, and that's a big, big job. Mr. Mayor, do you have anything to add? You know, I think that we're working with the city of Boston Public Health Department is working with the state uh, and being informed by, by your task force, Liz, um, Reverend Walker, when we get the vaccine to how we're gonna distribute it to people. I'll tell you my concern right now, and I don't know if Dr. Fauci touched upon this, is that the vaccine needs to be covered by health insurance because I see people in Boston that can't afford to get the test uh, unless they go to one of our free clinics or health center. And if the vaccine is not, is not covered by insurance, then many Americans, many Bostonians will be, will be cut out from even be able to get the vaccine because they don't have the money to pay for it. So I'm hoping that it's covered by insurance, number one. Um, and, and number two, we do have to get it out. Uh, it, it's, it's not the end all be all. And Dr. Fauci, I've heard him say this on, on TV that, you know, we're still going to be living with COVID-19 long after the, the vaccine comes out. It, it, it's, you know, we're still going to have to be doing masks and, and distancing and things like that. So we're going to be living like this for a while. But I, I do think that the vaccine, it, it has to come out of the box, meaning it has to be distributed equitable across all lines. Well, I can tell you, uh, as a member of this uh, uh, group of distribution uh, uh, committee, people are working really hard on how to do that. And it is complicated. Yeah. It is not just uh, black or white. It is not just young or old. It, uh, there are nuances. There are uh, uh, overlaps. There's all kinds of, of uh, decisions that have to be made. But people are working really hard to come up with some equitable way to do that. And I can speak uh, from that committee because I see them every week. Reverend Gloria, did you have anything to well, add? I think it's also important that the people who are conveying the message are people who are, who are credible and, and trusted uh, from within the community. Um, so I, that's uh, with, I'm certainly, uh, my husband and I, we, yes, we will get the vaccine. Uh, as soon as it's available, absolutely, we'll be a part of that group. Uh, here's a question for you, Mr. Mayor. It's uh, uh, 
from one of our viewers who's saying, what, what about homelessness, the mental health issues in the city and the vaccine? How is the city or how do you think those people, that population should be uh, reached out to? How's the city reaching out to them now? Because we have a real issue there. Yeah, from the very beginning, the homeless community, we, we went, went to work right away. Uh, we created um, other shelters, other beds around the city of Boston. So the homeless population that live in very confined spaces um, to make sure that there was physical social distance. We work with healthcare for the homeless to make sure that people uh, were, were, were giving the proper medicine and attention if they came down with COVID. We created isolation spaces. We created um, spaces for people that weren't COVID positive. Uh, we, we tested healthcare for the homeless, tested the homeless population, I believe almost twice throughout. Uh, we saw a 33% infection rate in the homeless population, about 1,600 people that live on the streets of Boston. Uh, and to my knowledge, 10 people lost their life. So when you think of the number, uh, which is percentage wise is fairly, it's, it's a low number. It's still 10 lives that we lost, 12 lives that we lost to my knowledge. But uh, as we think about the vaccine, it's gonna be the same as we do with testing. We're gonna be working with Healthcare for the homeless. We're going to be working with the providers in the city of Boston. We've been able to, we've been able to house, quite honestly, throughout this pandemic, 250 homeless folks, chronically homeless people that were on the streets. We were able to house them into permanent housing, wraparound. We created 2,250 permanent wraparound housing units in the city of Boston since 2015. Uh, so, so we have, I have, and we've made sure we have a special attention on homeless population. I wanted to just pivot a little bit to, to, the, to coping, and we're talking about coping kind of in a systemic way, but Mr. Mayor, how do you cope? Because I know you've got a lot of pressure on you. What do you do? Do you run? Are you an- are No. You, you know, uh, uh, Reverend White Hammond talked a little about spirituality, and I think that one thing that I might make some press here, I don't mean to, but one thing I think is missing today in today's society is spirituality. I think faith in a lot of ways is missing. And for me personally, what, what's gotten me through, what's gotten me through uh, every day of this uh, has been my spirituality and also um, being in recovery and living life a day at a time. And probably the hottest day I had as mayor of Boston um, in my time, my seven years, is days after George Floyd um, got killed because I felt as a mayor, um, I needed to say something and I need to say the right thing. And I, ne I needed to have everyone feel that it's going to be okay. And quite honestly, I, I you know, I, I didn't know, I didn't really, I was thinking that the pressure of that. And what I did was in, 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 in the days after is I listened to people and I had a meeting with the, 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 uh, it's an organization called Ben. It's a black employee network, people that work in city hall. And, and I went on with a Zoom and I went on a Zoom and I just listened to as everyone spoke and everyone was talking about their experiences with racism and, and, and what they dealt with. And, and what I thought was, and I've heard it, I heard it many times before, but what I thought was really interesting was that every story was the same. And as I talked to white people after that, I told them to take time and talk to their black colleagues and friends and ask them how they're doing and to, and to hear what they have to say. Because for too long, We've heard the stories of racism. We've heard the stories of racism in in, in jobs and in in being pulled over in in, in school and walking down the street and all the stories. Uh, and, and I said it's time for us to to hear the story. Mm -hmm. And for me, in that particular moment, I, I, I jumped on on an A meeting a couple of, a few days afterwards, and and I have a I have meditation or spiritual prayer on my phone on, on online. And I read it, and there was one one hearing, uh, one 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 passage was small steps forward, and it talked about daunting challenges in your life, and all you can do is take one small step in front of the other, and you get through it. So I've been able to get through it by taking one step in front of the other and getting through this. We've also set up, and to answer your previous question, we've also set up um, additional counseling for people to access in the city. So they call three one one, and they get tied into a counselor. This is a very traumatic time for people. It's a very traumatic time for children in our schools. It's a very traumatic time for a lot of people trying to cope with this. You know, alcoholism and drug addiction is a d disease of isolation. And, and this, is a, this is a great time, if you will. This is th the best isolation you can possibly get. So we need to make sure we have programs in place to help people move through there. Part of it is church and spirituality. And part of it is being real intentional 
on working on your own on your own well-being. So I ask people that are listening tonight that if you're struggling out there, reach out to somebody. Uh, reach out to you, reach out to your minister if you're if you're religious, or reach out to somebody to talk to them because because we we will all get through these times. Reverend Gloria, have you seen an uh, increase in membership or, or attendance at church during COVID? Sure, like so many congregations of faith, we are doing everything virtually, and I've heard from different religious traditions, large churches, smaller churches, all of us have much greater attendance uh, virtually. And I, I, I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One is, as, as my husband often says, if you lower the bar for engagement, people will actually come. There, there is an interest and a desire more than ever. And, uh, and then people really want to be in community and they, and they, and there is a craving for things spiritual. Okay. How do I begin to make meaning of this experience? Where, where does it fit into my reality? How, where does it fit into the larger reality? Mm -hmm. And I absolutely agree. Having that spiritual connection can really make a difference. It can be life-giving. Now, you also work in palliative care. I do. I would imagine that that would inform this time for you as well. Does that, is there any kind of uh, overlap with that? Sure. So palliative care is the, the, the discipline or the, the subspecialty in medicine that focuses on providing support for seriously ill individuals and their families. And it's a comprehensive support, of not only the medical uh, the psychosocial, uh, but also the spiritual support. So you're absolutely right. I, I, I do both of these things. So I, the palliative care is the place where my passion for uh, ministry and my passion for medicine come together. So yes, there's very, very much overlap in terms of, of supporting individuals who are experienced COVID or being concerned about COVID and providing spiritual support for them as well. So Lauren asks, um, you know, you guys are both pastors and churches as you've been talking about. What are the questions that you're hearing from your congregations? I would say 60% of our congregation is over 60. That would include me. I always forget that. <laughs> I always think I'm talking about the other people, but that's, that's me. And I think the most, uh, you know, a, a common Concern is people feeling isolated, just not feeling, you know, they can't get to see their cousins or their daughters or their sons and just not knowing what to do with that. And so that's a question that we try to, and we work on that really, and I'm sure that most ministers and most community leaders try to work on that now, this notion of continuing and keeping community going. So we know that we can't be with you physically but we're going to call you. We're going to Zoom you. We taught a lot of our older people how to use the computer. That was like a whole nother kind of new thing for us, uh, the notion of connecting. And I, I know that that's what Mr. the mayor has talked about, and, and you guys can jump right in, but that's one thing that's huge. It's huge in our trauma work because the whole idea, just like the mayor said, uh, isolation. Isolation is, is one of the, you know, the, the real... Uh, symptoms of, of a traumatic experience, you're cut off. And so we try to keep that open, that you are not by yourself, that best I can, I'm gonna call you, I'm gonna check on you, I'm gonna Zoom with you, whatever I can do. So we suggest people write letters. One day we got out as a church and went on a, uh, I think you call them caravans, and went to visit our older people just in the car, just to wave. The Boston Police Department was so kind as to escort us. And uh, it was wonderful. And you could see the delight on people's faces just to have the car go by. And, and, and it was probably about a dozen cars, but it made a huge difference in, in the day, you know, the feelings of our community. So there are lots of things you can do to reach out to people. Do you guys have any other tips on, on that connecting thing, Mr. Mayor or Gloria? Yeah, I would say um, that that has been our biggest challenge as well. And like, We've had now almost 50 individuals in our congregation who have contracted COVID-19, um, uh, several hospitalizations and ventilations. Fortunately, we haven't lost anyone, but I, I can't think of anybody in the congregation who doesn't know someone who's either been sick or someone who's died, either locally or from a distance. So there certainly is that sense of grieving those losses. But my sense is that people are generally grieving 
a loss of status quo, a loss of normalcy, a loss of what I of having a sense of what to expect. And uh, what has been gratifying is that people have been very open and honest about that. And we've, we've thought it important to normalize it. About four months ago, I was looking at some studies and there were 57% of Americans overall felt like their mental health was affected by the pandemic, 68% of African Americans. So this is a major issue among our congregations. And uh, so yes, we normalized it and offered a number of strategies for people. I just think that, you know, in response to a, a lot of this is also reaching out to people and touching base with them. I know congregations have done it from the beginning. We, we have tried to do phone calls to our seniors. We've done wellness checks on people. Um, I think people that are struggling, just making a phone call, checking with them, you know, n not even a text, a phone call. And, and I think that we, we, we get into technology, we're shooting people texts all of a sudden, and that's not a personal touch. And I think if somebody uses FaceTime, but I think those touches are, are so, so important. I always come up with, thank you, I always come up with those kind of corny things. But I, I have to tell you, one day I was... Uh, I was feeling really down and I ended up going to get, uh, it was a drive-in at one of the coffee shops and the young woman in the window, uh, I don't know who she was, was so nice to me. It made me cry. She was so, she said, well, how are you doing this morning? And she was just so, uh, she was probably a teenager. And I had to stop right there and I thanked her because I think those like random things that you can do to connect with people. Now, in this atmosphere we've been in, you have to worry that somebody will curse you out or, or scream at you because there's a lot of tension in the air. But uh, just that kind of being kind to a person just because they're human and just because they're here. That's what happened to me that day and it made a huge difference in my day. And I think those things really count right now. So I'd just like to add that. I think we have to be kind to ourselves. And sometimes we need to adjust our expectations of what we're going to accomplish during the day. And if we get to the end of the day and every box wasn't checked, you know, it, it's gonna be all right. Uh, the sun will come up tomorrow. I think that's great advice. Now, I think that we can take the next 15 minutes and just go with some tips like this, uh, because I think that matters. I think it really counts. I, I was watching television the anchor was a young woman and she said, okay, before we even go any further, just everybody just stop and breathe. And I thought, that's great. <laughs> I am sure that's not her script, but it's just realizing and being able to read, you know, this atmosphere we're in, uh, that everybody can take a break and everybody uh, can breathe. So now I'm gonna ask you both for your top five tips on coping uh, during this time. Um, so I, I have um, what I call the Never Would Have Made It journal, and it's based on a, a, a song that we sing, Never Would Have Made It Without You in My Life. And, uh, and I've been looking back over my lives and thinking of all the times that I never would have made it without God. And from incidents when I was a little girl to, to a bigger girl to things that just, just the fact that I, I got a decent night's sleep. I never would have made it without God. So I have this little journal and I pull it out and write things down and, uh, and then check it out every now and then. God is faithful. I think walking is important. Um, going for a walk and, and just, uh, for me, it's gratitude um, for the people I work with every day in City Hall uh, that have done some amazing things uh, for, for so many people in the city of Boston. My faith and prayer is important um, to, to you know be grateful for, you know, another day of sobriety for me, and then also just be grateful for uh, being healthy and, and, and praying for the sick and suffering person. Um, I do that every day, every night. Um, I think that, you know, one thing I would say is when, you, when you're going for a walk, saying hello to somebody. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right, Liz. I think we're, we're all on edge as a society all the time. And I think once in a while, just saying hello to somebody or how you doing, those are powerful words. Um, and you might not get a response back and you might not even get a nice response back, but, but passing that along, um, you know, th those are all coping skills. And then uh, a fun one is, um, you know, I really didn't never watch Netflix much until this pandemic. And I think I've watched all kinds of shows on Netflix now. So, you know, <laughs> Netflix has kept me going uh, in a lot of ways. But, uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's about gratitude. It's about gratitude. I, I thoroughly agree. I, I wake up every morning and my 
biggest spiritual practice is to start with gratitude. Uh, there is a text, a scripture that says, uh, I think it's uh, Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. So the point of this is to what am, what am I thankful for today? And, uh, and that's, that's how I start. But let me just tell you my TV habits. So I, I can't watch much TV anymore because it's all kind of dark. I'm watching The Crown now on Netflix, and that's really good. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> but I tend to watch, uh, um, I'm a Golden Girls fan, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and I've seen The Golden Girls at least 700 times. All the series, all of them. I could do The Golden Girls. I am one of the Golden But uh, there's something about watching something that, that you know is going to turn out right, that everybody's going to make a joke, that it's going to be light no matter what the stress I think that's a good thing to do. So I, I would suggest one of the things you can do is go back to the old shows, back to the old days, uh, when laughs were really easy, uh, not so easy anymore. The other thing I think that is really has become clear to me too, is to uh, really work on relationships. As Dr. Fauci talked about with his wife, friendships uh, mean much more to me. I have a group of friends that uh, I've known for 40, 50 years, and we make it a, a habit of trying to be on the phone uh, once a week. Uh, and, you know, and even if we don't have much to say, but, you know, just a little bit, it's just connecting. Because uh, I think that connection thing is really, really important. So, yeah. I and I, that's been very helpful just talking with some of my congregants. Uh, one of the things that, well, we encourage people to have some of these difficult conversations. There's a one of the, the books that has been helpful to me is a book by Ira Bioff, where he talks about the five important conversations to have, especially at end of life, but it turns out they're, they're just good conversations to have. And it, the five conversations are, um, forgive me, I forgive you, thank you, and I love you. And, um, and of course, when you're at the end of life saying goodbye, but it turns out those are powerful conversations to have just to have and uh, because many of us have been in relationships that have been challenged well this has been an important time to get on zoom and and begin dialoguing about some of the thorny issues and it's been exciting to hear i even in my own family how it is it has begun to affect some healing so even as a lot of things people are unfortunately are dying um some new life is happening in the context of some of our relationships could you give us those questions again, just so if people were making notes, forgive sure. me? Um, so forgive me, because there are things that I've done that I'm, and maybe even I didn't even agree that it was a problem, but it was a problem to, for you. Forgive me. I want, to, I want you to know I forgive you. I'm just not holding on to stuff. I'm not going to keep nursing these hurts. I forgive you. Thank you. Just pausing to say, you know what? I appreciate that. Um, and, uh, and again, affirming the love that I have for you. And uh, when, when someone is closer to death, uh, really saying those goodbyes. So those are, it, it turns out that they're not only good conversations to have at the point of death, but they're great conversations to have in the midst of living. One of the things that I have uh, kind of a revelation for me during this COVID time, because we all are so close to death, that's ultimately, that's the game. That's the, this, nobody's been this close, you know? And I remember when this all first started and the pictures came from Europe of, of bodies out and, we, and it was like, and then it came over here and we were doing that. But the one thing about being so close to death, I think that you just touched on, Gloria, is the reality that it's not just about dying, it's about how you live and how you value what you have and the time that you have. Uh, and I preach about that all the time. And, and living as if this is your last day, what would you do differently? Who would you call? How would you act? And I think that's really important. And I hope that people are you know, thinking, because here we are in this country, in the world, and we're all screaming at each other, and we're ranting at each other, we're all taking sides, and we're all, that is like the most childish behavior that we could ever do if this was our last day. So what would you do to, uh, I'm reading Viktor Frankl's uh, uh, Say Yes to Life, mm. really interesting book. Uh, his second book out of uh, the concentration camps uh, after the you know, man's search for meaning. And he talks about people who at their very last moment of life uh, chose to make meaning out of that last moment. 
you know, that it, it, knowing that they were going to die, they did something, you know, positive. It wasn't a religious statement for him. It was just this notion of you can have meaning no matter what. Uh, I found that a very a moving for me. And I think that we, these are the times that you're supposed to do that kind of thinking. Absolutely. Uh, don't you think? Oh, I do. And I have, have one of our members who died several years ago, when at the, she developed a, a cancer that was, not, was she, she was clear that she was not going to survive her cancer. And as she began to put things in order, she said that she wished that she had always appreciated what she appreciated in that moment, which was that life was not promised to any of us. And that she wished that she had lived her life every single day with that recognition that she would have made some different choices and some things she would have taken hold of and some things that she would have let go. And so that is a reality that we are all, you know, at any moment. And it's a, so it's an opportunity to not only think about death, but how to, how to live life well every day. Throughout the pandemic, we've learned to slow down. Mm. Um, I know that in, you know, earlier in the pandemic, we were having dinner at the table at five o'clock at night, um, myself and Laurie and her daughter and her daughter's uh, fiance. And every night we had conversations at the dinner table. And that's how I grew up. Like we, dinner was on the table at five o'clock. You had to come in. If you're outside, you came into house, house wash your hands inside the table. And, and, and over time we became a takeout generation where we're eating on the fly and having those dialogues were, were really important and, and having those conversations to really take time to enjoy each other. And I think, I think that, you know, pre COVID, you know, with cell phones and iPads and computers and this and that, we're running every which way. And I think that a lot of what you, both of you had talked about is about, you know, don't wait too long to understand what we have. And we all, we all live in different situations and everyone, and even on the, you know, the people that are listening tonight, everyone has different challenges, different problems. We all have problems. It's, it's, it's life but understanding and appreciating what you have too. And, and even if it's just, you you have life today, that it can get better. I think that that's important that, that as we think about it. And, and you know, I hope that when, when we, a year from now, when we're, when we're beyond, hopefully beyond the pandemic or beyond the situation we're in today, that we, we, we this, the, the slowing down of right now can continue on forward. Thank you both. We still have a few minutes, but I wanted to take the last few minutes to just talk about whatever gives you hope, what gives you optimism, what you'd like to leave our audience with, what you'd like to leave the, the city of Boston with, the, the region, people who are, who are looking in on this Zoom call to get through. So this is about how we're gonna get through this next season. What gives me hope is people um, watching just acts of kindness throughout this very difficult time. Um, the last three years in our city and our country have been difficult. It's been difficult for a whole host of different people and watching people step up on, on large scales, whether it was a women's march or fighting for immigrant rights, fighting, fighting you know, for equality, fighting against racism, f fighting to feed people, that gives me hope. And I would just suggest to everyone, sometimes you know, we all have overwhelming feelings, in including myself. It's a day at a time. It's literally a day at a time. And it's now, 757 and what i need to do is get to next couple hours go to bed go to sleep wake up and try and do something positive for me tomorrow but i can't worry about tomorrow because it's not here yet and i can't worry about yesterday because it's past you can only worry about the present moment so i just ask people to take life a day at a time i i would say something along the same line that i that in the midst of it i've been so encouraged by people's resilience and i when this all started, I, I never would have anticipated that we would still be here, and um, but we are. And even as people work through the challenges, the frustrations, the fears, the disappointments, the anxiety, we 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 are still here. With so there's a resilience in the midst of that, and that gives me encouragement. And that's that's who we are. And that's what we do. And uh, I thank God for God's faithfulness and the ways that that faithfulness shows up in the context of, of 
community, my wonderful husband and, uh, and you all and, and those who make up my beloved community of Boston. Well, again, I want to thank you both for joining us tonight because this was a great conversation. I think that we, I hope we've given you, the viewer, something to think about. I hope we've given you some specific information about COVID. If you have any other questions or you want to stay in touch with me, I just want to make sure that you know you can reach me on Twitter at at Liz Walker one or you can reach me on Instagram at, at Pastor Liz with two Z's. So that's really, really very, very, very important. I also want you to know that the Corey Johnson program has a weekly conversation on Zoom about trauma. And all you have to do to find out about that is go on to our website, rpcsocialimpactctr.org. RPC socialimpactctr.org. And that will give you the Zoom line number. Every Thursday night, we talk about all the pain that we have. We talk about our own vulnerabilities. It's a safe space. We talk about race sometimes. Uh, we believe that talking about it is one thing we can do to help each other. As the mayor said, to listen and to talk. It is really important. So please join us for that. We want to thank our partners for helping us with this conversation tonight. This was not just uh, Judell Cummins and Reverend Liz Walker. This was Boston Medical Center, who's been wonderful, Bethel AME Church, Reverend Gloria's Church, Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, the Massachusetts Health Council, and our, our beloved Boston Red Sox. We are actually uh, broadcasting this Zoom because of the strength of their Wi-Fi from Fenway. So that's our kind of our point of origin tonight. They have been so kind to us. And so we want to thank you all for helping us. This is about a community that's working together. Uh, if you have any questions, get in contact with us. Take care of yourself. Wear the mask no matter what. Stay distanced no matter what. And please never forget that you matter. You absolutely matter. We care about you. Reverend Gloria, because this is our event and nobody else's we can end this bad boy in prayer would you pray yes. us out absolutely god for the we are in the midst of all that is swirling around us we are so grateful we thank you for being god we thank you for the grace to face the future with less fear and more faith and we remain confident of this that the god that we serve working among us, God, and with this community can do anything but fail. And it is to your name we pray. Amen. 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 Good night, everybody. Be safe. Wear that mask. <laughs>